Okay, welcome everyone to the Little Lungs Paediatric Asthma Update. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name's Catherine Ferreira. I'm the a Continuous Quality Improvement Programme Officer at the uh, Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network. So before we start, then I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. So the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of the land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, the Boon Wurrung people and the Wathaurong people. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start. So, Everyone's muted um, so that we don't get any background noise. So if you've got any questions, please ask them via the Q&A box. There'll be some Q&A, we'll answer some of those questions in the middle of the presentation and also at the end. This session's also being recorded. So questions, if you keep your questions anonymous, um, so we'll keep them anonymous to protect your privacy. Now, if you've joined the session using a different name that you registered with, um, you'll need to change that. So it's really important that you join the session with the same name that you registered with so that we can mark your attendance for CPD purposes. So this slide is just showing you how you can change your name. We have Jen um, doing backend support, so she'll also be able to help you. But to change your name, please click on the participants button at the top of the Zoom window and then hover your mouse over your name in the participants list on the right hand side of the Zoom window. Click on rename and enter the name you registered with. Don't worry if this doesn't work, we can, we'll, we'll be able to sort it out later. So I'd like to introduce our speaker then. Our speaker is Alana Hoy, she's an asthma educator. Alana has been employed as an asthma educator since 2001 for the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District Asthma Service. The Asthma Service delivers a self-management asthma education program to adult and paediatric asthma patients. The aim of the program is to improve asthma health outcomes and to reduce hospitalizations. Alana has been presenting for the National Asthma Council for over 10 years and her professional interests are in allergy and smoking cessation. Alana's obtained her postgraduate certificate in allergy nursing, which is complementary to her asthma role. And in the last three years, the service has evolved in supporting patients who have had severe asthma and have prescribed biologics. So asthma, I'll hand over to you, sorry. <laughs> Alana, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for having me on behalf of the National Asthma Council. I hope you enjoy this um, webinar tonight on our very tricky customers of paediatric asthma. Um, I'd just like to quickly show you what we're gonna talk about, some of the topics that we're covering, where to find your information, Having a bit of knowledge about the pathophysiology will certainly help you in diagnosis and management principles for children. We'll talk a little bit about um, written asthma action plans and hopefully you will feel more confident to um, write an action plan after this session. Just looking at some acute management issues in primary health care. And then we talk a little bit about the COVID-19 guidelines. Our learning objectives tonight. So just take you through um, the principles of the Australian Asthma Handbook. We'll look at the management as per different age groups for children. And we'll just go through some important points on written asthma action plans. So this is our Australian Asthma Handbook. This is our evidence-based best practice guidebook. It is very extensive and I do encourage everybody to have a good look at it. I can guarantee it will ask 
It will answer any question that you have in terms of um, asthma management in children. So you looking at diagnosis, uh, management principles, um, acute asthma, any um, contributing factor uh, and clinical issues that are related to anyone with asthma. Um, so jump in there and have a good look. Um, this is the National Asthma Council website who I'm presenting on behalf of tonight. And if you just go to their main web page, you can see that up the top there, you can link to the Australian Asthma Handbook from the National Asthma Council website. Also, you can click on next to that handbook and get into the Sensitive Choice website, which is a great resource for fact sheets, um, products and services that are endorsed for patients who have asthma and allergies. Let's have a few facts in regards to children. Look, it's one of the most common reasons that children present to your primary health uh, network. Um, children that go to emergency departments and admissions of hospital to children. So it's the most common reason. It's the most common reason children are absent from school. And the majority of these hospitalizations do occur in February. So we think that it's because children have been away from the school environment for six weeks or more over the school holiday period. They're coming back into that school environment and sharing viruses. Um, they're exposed to allergens and irritants, and often they've come off their preventer medication over those summer months. The new guidelines do state to not cease preventer medication at the beginning of the school year because of this increase in asthma flare-ups occurring in the February period. Um, we have now gone into the version 2.2 of the Australian Asthma Handbook, but about two years ago, asthma guidelines for children had a really big overhaul. And I'll tell you some of those major changes as we go along. So we're looking at asthma being more common in the boys when they're young, but at puberty, it switches over to females. Um, we know that not all children that wheeze end up with asthma and two thirds of those children actually grow out of uh, wheeze by the time they're six. We can have um, some likelihood of those children that do go on to have asthma in this young age group. And those uh, are children with a personal history of allergy are more likely than others. Um, I look, 21% of children age one to 12 will have asthma reported that disturbs their sleep in the last four weeks. And that's a really red flag for you, looking into children who have sleep disturbance. So symptoms are waking them at night. Very big flag and always ask that question. Some points to take away tonight. Asthma is chronic with acute flare-ups. It can't be cured, but it can be beautifully controlled with the right management. It's defined as having excessive variation in lung function, and we can measure this through spirometry once a child is able to perform the test. So it's your objective measure for for lung function and it compares others to a normal population. Remembering that asthma is reversible, so we're going to have times of spirometry where we've got a uh, normal good baseline and other times where we might prove obstruction on that spirometry. Uh, respiratory, respiratory symptoms are variable be between individuals. And those individuals may report mild symptoms, other times might report moderate symptoms, and 
do have the potential to have severe life-threatening episodes. Remember that our obstruction or our narrowing of the airway is due to three main things. And this is another word that I want to take uh, for you to take away with you tonight about asthma. It's an inflammatory condition of the airway. So if we're thinking of inflammation, that's where we're going to focus our treatment. So we've got inflammation of the lining of the airway of the bronchioles. We've got uh, constriction of the smooth muscle around those bronchioles. And we've got an increased mucin, mucus production, which is abnormal to the normal airway. So this just highlights what's going on in that airway lumen. So if you look at the smooth muscle that surrounds a bronchiole, you can see that from irritation and inflammation, it's likely to uh, spasm at various times for that person with a sensitive airway. Hopefully you're very familiar with the pathophysiology of asthma. Asthma is now considered an umbrella term for lots of different phenotypes. And uh, as research uh, plows along, we're identifying different subgroups of asthma. Um, we'll just have a little look at triggers uh, for asthma in children, which are very similar to those uh, adults and adolescents who have asthma. And you know, the most common trigger that we have is rhinovirus or the common old cold. We know that certain strains or species of the common old cold may um, cause more severe flare-ups than others. And this could maybe explain why some flare-ups are mild, some are moderate, some are severe, or the child can get through a cold without a flare-up of wheeze. Um, and, you know, young children do have, you know, up to 10 to 12 common old colds per year in their young years of life. Um, exposure to cigarette smoke and e-cigarettes at the moment, water pipes, uh, is a trigger, especially for children who wheeze in that under two years of age. Um, weather conditions. So when there's a change in air temperature, you know, going from that warm day to a, a cold change in the evening, Cold air seems to be a problem for people with asthma as opposed to warm, humid air. Um, and uh, so look out for that in the winter time as a trigger. Allergens. So young children can be sensitized to allergens very early. We're looking at animals. So um, a protein that is found in the saliva of animals or that is secreted in the sebaceous glands of the animal. Of course, the animals lick themselves, their dander flies up into the air and you inhale that allergen. Cats and horses, definitely. Dogs too, um, but there seems to be a small protective measure of dogs if you are exposed to them in your first year of life. Um, things like cat allergen can hang around um, in the environment for some time, even though the cat has been removed. Um, pollens, of course, we're into our grass pollinating season at the moment, and we have a very long pollinating season in Australia. Uh, you guys in, um, in Victoria, especially around that Melbourne area, you've heard of thunderstorm asthma and the link with grass pollinating season as we get into that um, late spring thunderstorm situation. Mold spores, air pollution, um, another a contributing factor and exercise. I often try to delve a little bit deeper into what's happening at exercise. Just make sure it's not normal huff and puff. And sometimes you can ask what is happening at rest after that strenuous exercise? Do symptoms continue after that person has 
has stopped exercising? Does breathlessness settle down? What are the other symptoms? And how long are they going for at that rest mark? I think that young children who are having uh, breathlessness on play or just from exerting themselves does indicate to you that asthma is poorly controlled because the asthma is interfering with normal daily activity. So watch that one. That's a good red flag for you to ask as well. So some of those major changes to the paediatric handbook guidelines, um, this is one of those major changes. So um, 0 to 12 months was taken out of that age limit. Um, so wheezing in children under 12 months are not to be considered asthma and not to be treated as asthma. If you are concerned a young, for a young um, infant with wheeze and uh, chronic respiratory symptoms, just refer them on to a specialist. And um, salbutamol is uh, discouraged in this age group. So this is our first age group in the handbook, the one to five years, and very, very tricky to tease out what's going on with these young children. We know that wheeze occurs for other reasons in this age group. So we want to take a very, very thorough history of what's going on. Um, look at family history of asthma, or allergic rhinitis, uh, eczema in parents or siblings. Look at their exposure to uh, smoking or other um, harmful chemicals. Did mum smoke whilst pregnant? Has the child been exposed um, in the house in the first few months of life? Really look into noisy breathing. Are what the parents reporting generally wheeze? Um, if it is responding to a bronchodilator, so if you've got some noisy breathing and you give some bronchodilator and it goes away, then you're probably on the right track. But explore what those noises are and what's happening with that child, with the parent. Has there been a doctor diagnosed wheeze? I like to answer that, get the parents to answer that question for me. Um, having a look at the frequency and timing of these episodes, has it reoccur? Is there two or more of the most common symptoms for asthma reoccurring um, and have a, have a look at some physical aspects um, on examination. So um, usually we're auscultating for wheeze, we're looking at increased work of breathing um, at the times of acute symptoms, looking at cough, is cough persistent? Is cough worse at night? Um, you could also look into signs of rhinitis. So children generally uh, will rub their nose quite a bit and in an upward um, motion because their nose is itchy and irritable. They might get the allergic crease across their bridge of their nose. And this is actually known as the allergic salute. You know, you generally can tell a child with allergic rhinitis quite quickly. So they're really snuffly, they're nasally uh, speaking, they've got dry lips. Um, when they're eating, they're finding it very difficult. Um, I always like to know if they're a snorer, their mouth breathing in their sleep, they're waking up very dry. So look at those points in, in terms of allergic rhinitis because we know the majority of people with a confirmed diagnosis of asthma also have allergic rhinitis. Uh, look at the shape of the chest. Um, you might look for any clubbing of the fingers if they've had lots of steroids. Um, yeah, and the next thing to do is 
look for response to a treatment trial. So do symptoms go away with an inhaled bronchodilator or have you prescribed a treatment trial of an inhaled corticosteroid or Montelukas and do symptoms go away? And you generally get a feel for that in about a week um, that parents are reporting a good response to treatment with that. But remembering takes a little bit uh, to work, some weeks. So you want to review at that two to four weeks. Sorry, Alana, you've just uh, muted there. Can you just go back? Sorry, beg your pardon. Have I missed anything? Uh, um, no. Just when you I've just started that, with yes. this slide, so yes. yeah, apologies. Yes, so um, the one to five years group, again, very tricky. Pattern your asthma, look for frequency and severity of symptoms that will help you guide treatment. So you're looking at symptoms that are occurring at least every four to six weeks for these children. You're looking at moderate to severe um, pattern if it disrupts the child's sleep and play. Look for some validated uh, questionnaires like the childhood asthma control test and that will help you get that information off that patient. Um, you're going to start with low dose inhaled corticosteroid or Montelukas. Uh, with Montelukas, discuss the, um, the side effects with the parent first, talking about behavioural changes and go from there. If something like a chewable tablet once a day is going to help with adherence, that may be why you're uh, prescribing Montelukast over an inhaled corticosteroid. But there are your two options there. Um, we have a very, very small proportion of children who need combination therapy and combination therapy is um, only recommended for children over four for serotide. So if you're thinking about combination therapy, please refer up to a specialist. We want to provide these parents and carers with a written asthma action plan. So what to do when your child is having a flare up. Uh, that PMDI, for those who aren't familiar with some of the uh, names for our asthma inhalers, that means pressured metered dose inhaler. So that refers to our common old puffer devices. We're going to be using a spacer with or without a mask. So children four and under will pop the mask on. From about four, uh, check their device by using the mouthpiece. Just remembering that our nose is a bit of a filter, so it is more effective to use the mouthpiece of the spacer once a child is able to um, adequately use that device without a mask. Um, looking at a diagnosis, so this is where we can really confirm a diagnosis with asthma. I say to parents of that un under um, a six age group, look, don't worry about the label too much. We've got to wait and see. Um, yes, there are some likelihoods, but don't worry because we're going to treat the same way. So it doesn't matter whether you've got um, a confirmed diagnosis of asthma or not in that age group, those children that do need treatment are treated the same way as those children with a confirmed diagnosis. And why can we do it now at six years? Well, most children now 
can do spirometry. So spirometry is our gold standard to diagnose asthma, to monitor lung function over time and adjust treatment according to that lung function. This table that you see on the slide at the moment, this is in the handbook. So have a little look at this and um, it'll guide you in a diagnosis of asthma and when to refer on and when to organise some different tests. We're going to um, delve into those next four points in the next couple of slides. So I won't go into that table too much. So when we're looking at a history, look at symptoms. Is there two or more symptoms that reoccur on different occasions that are triggered off by some of the main um, triggers that we have, allergens and irritants of the airway. Is wheezing accompanied by difficulty breathing or a persistent cough? Has the child got other features that go with asthma? So looking at allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, eczema, is there a strong family history of asthma and allergies with the parents and siblings? Nothing else is suggestive of an alternative diagnosis for these children. And importantly, let's look at the response to a bronchodilator demonstrated on spirometry. So what you would do for diagnosis is you would do a baseline and then give the child a bronchodilator, four puffs of salbutamol via a spacer and then do a post uh, spirometry test and see whether you're getting a clinically important response to that bronchodilator. So different to adults, we're looking for a 12% increase, um, but with adults, you're looking at a 12% plus a 200 mil increase in your FEV1 or your FBC. What are we going to do about children who are six and over? Um, so everybody needs a blue puffer. So all children need to be prescribed with um, a reliever medication to use when needed for the relief of asthma symptoms. And try and explain that to your patients as well. Get into the right terminology um, for your asthma management. Talk about things like flare-ups. Talk about the blue ones are your reliever medication. So you only use them to relieve symptoms. These other coloured puffers are your preventers. Remember, we want to prevent flare-ups and symptoms. So we're going to take them every day, whether you are sick or whether you are well. Regular preventer is to be prescribed in some of those children who do have symptoms um, at least four to six weekly apart. And again, that disrupt the child's sleep or play. Um, dose is determined by the risk and severity of flare-ups. So certainly looking at children that are admitted to hospital, whether they've had an ICU admission, whether they've needed oxygen therapy, uh, length of stay. Um, it may be how many doses uh, or courses of um, prednisone that they've had in the last six months and, um, you know, frequency of symptoms. Um, treatment is based on a stepped approach. And we'll go through that in the next slide. So I hope everybody is familiar with the stepped approach to asthma management. Now, the stepped approach is an approach that happens over all age groups, but it is a little bit different um, between adults and children between the ages of six and 11. So if you see that first box there, our largest box in step one 
everybody needs to be prescribed an as needed uh, reliever medication. For those that are not familiar with the term, uh, SABA means short acting beta agonists. They're your blue inhalers, blue gray inhalers. If you can see the, that arrow there, that's pointing to the step two, which is that navy blue box there. Uh, some children are going to be prescribed regular preventer medication. And remember, it's those children that have frequent symptoms, severity of flare-ups, and are, um, are you know, having uh, symptoms upon uh, activity and sleep disturbance. Sorry, it's late in, late in the evening. I've talked all day. Um, so your options are a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So that's what ICS means or Monte Lucas, which is our chewable tablet. A few children do get stepped up to the next box. So step three. And I want to highlight here that at step two, we really need to check adherence before we, we step up. Check adherence to the medication, check the regime, check whether their pattern of use is intentional or unintentional. So if you've got somebody that didn't want to give their child medication unnecessarily, that's why they ceased their medication. Um, then that was that person's intention. Or if you've got families that are just really, really busy and forget and they're rushing out of the door in the, in, in the mornings late for school and have forgotten their reliever, uh, their preventive medication. So have a look at why pattern of use or adherence is low before you even consider stepping up to the next box. So I keep, I call, uh, these um, issues, the housekeeping of asthma. Check on the housekeeping. Is the child using the right device for their age group? And is adherence to medication optimal? Are we looking at any other conditions that may be contributing to poor control? And your number one reason there is allergic rhinitis followed by exposure to cigarette smoke or other allergens that are impacting. So these few children, if we're not gaining good control on low dose, can have their ICS stepped up. They may be considered for a low dose combination therapy or keep the low dose of the inhaled corticosteroid low and add in Monte Lucast as your options. What is good asthma control? Asthma control is based on the previous four weeks. So your current asthma control is based on that. We need to also consider previous risk factors so any other ICU admissions or what that child has needed in terms of their asthma management in the past. So that's your risk factors, but we're looking at asthma control. So remembering that people with asthma are poor perceivers of their health. They give themselves permission to have symptoms. It's just a bit of asthma. Oh yes, I do wake at night but that's because I have asthma. Let's change the mindset of our patients with asthma and say, no, good asthma control means none of these things. No night waking, very little day symptoms, no use of your um, reliever medication. And if you do use it, then that is less than twice per week. No limitations to your daily activities. Then we've got people who have partial control. So their daytime symptoms are a little bit more than two days per week. Um, they're only short and sharp. They're quickly relieved by um, our bronchodilator. Uh, they have some limitations. Oh. 
Lana seems to have frozen. Just bear with us while we try and get her back. Can everybody hear me and can everybody hear me and see me now? Yes, everything's fine, Alana. Yeah. I'm so sorry, it just shut down. I had to get back into this yeah. meeting. No, these things Probably. happen. Yeah. Um, I hope we're at this slider. I think we are. So reasons for poor asthma control. So incorrect device technique. So look at the age of the child and prescribe that inhaler according to their age group. Um, we do have a table coming up of what device is appropriate for what age group. Um, at every opportunity, get the device technique um, assessed. Don't ever underestimate what patients are actually doing with their inhalers. Um, the other reason is poor adherence to preventive therapy. Um, we all know that patients stop their preventer once they are well because they don't have an understanding of the benefits for long-term use. Uh, looking at allergies, is anything else impacting on that asthma control? Um, we know that uh, poor asthma knowledge and the principles around asthma management um, when somebody has poor health literacy are not going to be managing that asthma um, optimally. Uh, they don't have an asthma plan and they don't seek regular asthma review. They tend to have that opportunistic acute asthma um, presentations to your surgeries and to hospital. Or is it just not asthma? If you've ticked all the above and you've done your housekeeping, have a look for some alternative diagnoses. And this table you will find in the handbook. We're just having a quick look at this. We're not going through anything in this presentation. But if you wanted to have a little look at some alternative diagnosis, find that in the asthma handbook. When should we have review? Well, if you looked at that stepped approach and you've made the decision to prescribe a child with a preventer medication, you want to have some um, review that demonstrates to you that we're on the right track and it's working. So get them in with that uh, four to six week mark, check your adherence, check device, and check that uh, symptoms have gone away and there is good asthma control reported. We are stepping down. So when I showed you that stepped pyramid, you can see that there's arrows on the other side. So it's six months with children, which is different to adolescents and adults. We can step off preventer and just go back to as needed reliever medication. We want to have a review before the beginning of the school year and alert parents to this February flare-up phenomenon and that we want good asthma control before they hit the new school year. Um, checking um, and reviewing each time medication is changed, so whether you've stepped up treatment or you've stepped down, um, we we always advocate as they're discharged from hospital to see their GP within two to three days of discharge and then at that four weeks uh, post-discharge from hospital. There's some of the validated questionnaires that you can um, use to identify asthma control in your patients and you can find them in the Australian Asthma Handbook. Um, at each review, check on um, symptoms. Remember to have a look at any night waking, any symptoms upon um, activity. Look at their past adverse events for identifying 
are future risks for poor asthma outcomes. And again, that's your life-threatening um, sudden onset. So most of the kids are going to be symptomatic for a couple of days. Asthma, asthma only comes on like that or a sudden asthma attack on a very, very low percentage of people. Most have early warning signs. Perform spirometry at each opportunity, especially if you're stepping up or stepping down on treatment. Remember to check all those housekeeping things that we've discussed before. Um, I haven't uh, delved too much into treatment in regards to allergic rhinitis, but remember how detrimental it is and what it impacts on somebody's asthma control Always treat allergic rhinitis as part of your asthma management. It can be seasonable. If it's grass allergy season, you're only symptomatic at those times, then treat your allergic rhinitis at those times. Any questions at this point in yes. time? We have got three questions, Alana. Yeah. Um, I'm just a bit concerned about the time because it's... It's 13 minutes past seven. Yep. Would you like yep. to answer them now? or Yep, okay. Maybe one or two, yeah. Okay. So the first one is, a week ago, my 12-year-old daughter started on Montelukas. Monta Should she wean off or cease fixoxotide? Now she is symptom-free. What types of behavioural issues have you seen in your clinical practice? Um, I haven't seen uh, the extreme of that behaviour which um, there's, I think there's been about two cases of uh, reported suicide ideation, but mainly I see that the child is a bit sooky or very emotional, wants a lot of cuddles, maybe some sleep disturbance um, or some aggression. Yeah. But, you know, I see that in a very small portion. In terms of being on two preventers, Check your step up, step down approach. So you're going to review that at your six months. And if all is well, then you can consider stepping off one of those preventers for sure. Great. Thank you. Second question is what age can Symbicort be used at? Uh, 12, 12 and over. And I'm getting to the questions in regards to medication in the next slide. Yeah. Um, third question, if once on Montelukas and there's no ICS and there's an asthma flare, what medication is recommended? Would it be Saba, prednisolone, single or double dose, fluticasone or other? Um, so we're on Montelukas as our mainstay regular preventer medication. We're having a flare associated with a virus, I'm thinking. We would um, increase the use of our reliever medication at this time. And if the severity warrants it, uh, a child would be put on a course of oral corticosteroids for three to five days. And I will talk a little bit more about that in acute asthma. Right. As well. And the last question. Is any tips on how to ask patients to demonstrate their device techniques so that they don't feel scrutinised? Um, I don't find my patients do feel scrutinised. Um, I just say, oh, show me how you use your puffer at home. And if they have had a incorrect step in that device technique, I say, how about we just, look, that's pretty good, but how about we just tweak it to perfection? So you might make some little changes there. Um, look, it has been really difficult during the COVID pandemic because normally I have placebos and I get the patients to use placebos and demonstrate to me. I will also demonstrate with my own placebos. But because we're all in PPE and we can't remove that or breach our PPE, I have been using the National Asthma Council um, demonstration videos or I have been using brochures which have step-by-step -step instructions um, for correct device technique. And look, I, I sympathise with you guys 
look at that poster. There is so many devices on the market today and they're all a little bit different in their step-by-step. -step. So um, be familiar with your, your main ones. There is a... Um, a checklist in on the National Asthma Council website, which has a step-by-step -step instruction to each inhaler. So if you wanted that in front of you and you're assess, assessing the device technique, you can just do a bit of a tick that the patient met all the steps for correct device um, technique. Uh, sometimes you'll need to change that device because the patient just does not comprehend how to use that device correctly. And remember, these patients, if they're using their device incorrectly, this is a habit and we need to reinforce the correct technique at every opportunity. Um, we are running a little bit late, so I'll just keep going and then we'll answer more questions at the end. Uh, for those that may need to leave on time. So this is the most current poster. Please download it at, um, from the website and have it at your availability. It will help you to identify where particular inhalers fit according to their uh, category. So look at your uh, reliever medications. They're all blue in colour. They're all salbutamol except for Bricanel, which is a different bronchodilator. Um, and then we've got our inhaled corticosteroid preventers. They're trying to keep them into some autumn colours so that we're easily recognising those inhalers as preventer medications. Um, now, somebody asked me a question about Symbicort. I just want to highlight in this poster that for children, we do have age limits for some of the preventers and some of the combinations. So let's just have a quick look at that preventer column. So you've got your fluticasone, it, which can be prescribed for children and young children under five. Um, Alvesco is TGA approved for six years and over. Um, and some of those other preventers again for six and over. If you have a look, say at Palmacourt, you wouldn't prescribe a young child Palmacourt because of the device that it comes in. So that device is not recommended for children. Um, who, you know, I would, I would even advocate a spacer for kids in their late primary years. So you're looking at a device as, as well as is this medication TGA approved for children of that age group. If we just have a little look at combination therapy, we've got serotide for those over uh, four years of age but your Symbicort is for 12 and over, your Cipla is for 16 and over, and things like Fosair is for 18 years and over. So again, you're going to uh, prescribe according to device, according to um, recommendations of your stepped approach and the severity of your um, patients, and also for what they are approved according to age groups. Just remember that some of our medications have um, a slow onset. Some of them have a fast onset. Some of them are short acting. So our short acting beta agonists, as opposed to our long acting beta agonists. Our long acting beta agonists, Oxus, we can use that as a reliever medication for children over 12 because it has a fast onset. But we can't do that with serotide because salmeterol, the larva found in serotide, serotide has a slower onset of action. You'll find this fantastic table within the handbook. Now this 
talks about low and high doses of inhaled corticosteroids for children. And remember, one number of one ICS does not match the number for another ICS. So let's just look at fluticasone, which is our most common ICS for younger children. So a low dose there is 100 to 200 micrograms per day. If we're looking at cyclesonide, which is our Alvesco for children, six years and over, low dose is 80 to 160 micrograms per day. So if you are looking to change device or change your preventer and you've got good control on low dose fluticasone and say you want to go to Alvesco because it's once daily, then you would match that low dose um, with that new inhaler. Uh, another great table just looking at devices which are appropriate for age groups. So all children can have a spacer with a mask um, and an MDI. So remember our metadose inhalers, our puffers. Uh, at about um, four years of age, we can remove that mask and just assess the child with a mouthpiece. We're looking about those later primary school years of having dry powder devices or breath activated devices. Um, look, I'm all for spaces in all children because it's not effort dependent. When we've got dry powder devices or breath activated devices, our tricky little customers, you know, when they're not so cooperative, uh, won't give you in a good inspiratory flow rate to activate that device off. Written asthma action plans. Look, they are there to tell us what to do when we are having a flare up. We know uh, that a written asthma action plan improves health outcomes, reduces hospitalizations, and gets that patient back to wellness quicker. Um, they are usually uh, set out the the templates that you can use, which are all on the website, are set out in a traffic light approach. So if we're in the green zone, we're well, go, go, go. Asthma's well controlled. We're having very little symptoms. We're having very little need for reliever medication use. Yellow zone, just like a traffic light, proceed with caution. Red, get ready to stop. This is an emergency. Keep information in your action plan very simple don't use medical jargon and i always like to put in that other instructions if you can see in that you know we'll go back um, to that slide i will put in in that green box i'll put stuff like um you know rinse and spit after your inhalers their treatment for their allergic rhinitis, make sure you have your flu shot, make sure you have a dental checkup. When, so our generally for children, our preventive medication is gonna remain the same in each box, but as we uh, go down our action plan and our asthma control is deteriorating, we're going to add in more reliever medication. If we get to that red box, we're possibly going to add in prednisone, but be very careful with children because parents decide that this is a license to just treat at home. And we want, treat, we want children to hospital with an acute flare up in a timely manner. So sometimes we find, uh, you know, oral steroids prescribed on an action plan um, for young children, the parents just stay home too long. So make sure that you're telling them, this is when you need to go to hospital. And they make that very clear on that action plan. If you are using more than so much of your reliever medication and it's not lasting, 
you for at least three hours, you're heading off to hospital. Our symptoms returning on the third to fourth hour as our reliever medication is wearing off and uh, we're just no better after 24 hours. Let's see the GP. Um, some of those early warning signs for young children, you know, they usually got the snuffy blocked nose. Day one, they're starting to cough. They might start to wheeze on day two or three. I'm generalising there because everybody is very individual. They may have some dark circles under their eyes. They're pale. They're very irritable. And with young children, just remember that behaviour doesn't always indicate the severity. So, you know, young children, you can say, hey, you want to go and get an ice cream and they will perk up. So their behaviour is not indicating to us how sick they are. Life threatening if they're floppy, if they're um, very lethargic, then you're going to worry about a young children. Um, symptoms of acute asthma so increased work of breathing difficulty breathing breathing faster more obvious um, than what we normally uh, are breathing uh, wheeze may be present remember our silent chest when we're having a life-threatening flare-up wheeze is a sound of air if we've not moving enough air because we're so obstructed, then we're not generating a noise. Cough, what's the cough doing? Is it so persistent? Is it particularly worse at night and in the early hours of the morning? Any use of accessory muscles? Have we got tracheal tug? You know, we're sucking in here. Have we got sucking in between the ribs or under the sternum? Is, you know, in young kids, is the belly re working really hard? So always teach your patients to take off a young child's top and have a little look at that chest. Are they pale? Are they lethargic and irritable? We want to assess severity in general practice. So the next slide is going to show you what signs and symptoms we will see according to severity. You want to start by giving them first line bronchodilators, do a secondary assessment, um, you know, either escalate to a tertiary institution if you think necessary, manage, get them back, follow up, check in a couple of days. Certainly after this flare up, let's get you in to talk about your um, asthma management. So uh, I teach parents at home, how's your child talking to you? So if we're having any difficulty with our speech or in younger children, they cry, so their speech is broken into single words and sentences, then you know we've got some severity there. Um, usually, you know, in the mild to moderate, they're still happy running around being their normal self but they've got some mild symptoms there and their oxygen saturations are sitting above 94 percent severe any use of those accessory muscles having a look at as i said speech is affected um, their breathing is now obvious their distress is now obvious and your sats are sitting at 90 to 94 percent life-threatening uh, reduced consciousness. Um, they're not speaking really at all to you. They're exhausted, cyanosed, and we've got some oxygen sats at below 90%. What are we going to do for mild to moderate? Well, we're going to administer salbutamol via a spacer. For our one to five, we're going to give two to six puffs. And for children over six years, four to 12 puffs. Um, we're going to repeat at the 20 to the 30 minute mark for the first hour. Keep that oxygen saturation above 95%. Uh, just observe and monitor it for at least three hours. Because this, if I want to put it 
in a way that you'll remember, I say to the patient, the expectation is if I give you this much of your blue puffer, I expect that it's going to make your symptoms go away for at least three hours before it's starting to wear off. So if your emergency puffer is not working for the time I expect it to, then we need to um, go and get some medical attention. And that's at the hospital. Call an ambulance. And we can continue to give salbutamol via spacer four puffs every four minutes if you've got a nebulizer. Um, only use that if the patient is unable to breathe through a spacer. So look, us older nurses and doctors, we all know that we popped a nebulizer on everybody that came through the door and gave them some Ventolin and Atrovent. Nebulizers aren't in trend. They increase side effects. You have to give more of the dose for the same clinical benefit through a puffer and the spacer. If we're having a life-threatening episode, let's give two 2.5 milligram nebules for the one to fives with oxygen um, and continuous nebulization for the six years, two times five milligram nebs. Um, monitor and make sure we get that oxygen saturation. Obviously, we're arranging immediate transfer to a tertiary institution. Now we use IV magnesium sulfate as our third course of a, um, a bronchodilator. So after we've added in some nebulized attribute there. Um, if uh, our breathing difficulties are dyspnea does improve and we're making it to that third hourly, then we're going to switch back to the puffer and spacer as our device. These are your acute asthma management tables, um, which are in the handbook. So you might want to print those out and just keep them close by. If you've got a child that's coming in that you're concerned about. Uh, we always want follow up after an acute flare up in the next two to three days. Uh, look at their risk factors, look at their triggers. Um, are we on preventer? Um, do we have reliever medication available? Has the child got a good written asthma action plan? And are the parents educated? Um, and spirometry to follow up after that flare up. So once the virus has resolved, then it's time to do some spirometry. This is the community first aid protocol. So we give four separate puffs of a short acting beta agonist. A person needs to take four breaths in per puff. So your rules of the spacer is a shake, one dose in, the person has four breaths in and out. Wait four minutes. I say the magic number for asthma is four. I'm going to have four puffs because that's a good starting dose for anyone of any age. I'm going to have four breaths between each puff. Um, it's going to work in four minutes and it's going to last me roughly four hours. If symptoms persist after that four puffs initially, then we repeat it again and we give another four puffs. If no improvement after those eight puffs, we're going to call an ambulance. These new first aid posters are very, very new in the last few weeks. Um, so again, print some out and have them around. Um, asthma and COVID. I don't know about you guys, but I can't wait till this pandemic is over. Um, so look, just check uh, that everybody has a current asthma action plan. Avoid nebulizers where you can. If you are performing spirometry, go by the guidelines of um, the Thoracic Society. And they are things like um, using a bacterial viral filter, um, only do it when necessary, um, and some of your infection control recommendations. You will find that on, on the website if you need those um, recommendations for 
reintroducing spirometry in your primary care. Um, we don't stop asthma medications during this time, so continue with your preventers, including oral steroids if you need to. Um, and remembering that our nebulizers are an aerosol generating procedure, as is our spirometry. And just keep, you know, devices uh, that are for single person use only. Um, these are where you can find additional information. So those first three are all part of that National Asthma Council. Um, and they are our uh, national professional peak body for guidelines. So have a look at their website and the handbook. Um, I just acknowledge the um, people that put this presentation together, our expert panel. And thank you so much, everybody. There is a QR code here for you to just put your camera on and it will lead you to the evaluation to fill in. Please fill in that for us. That's great. I am sorry that I've gone eight minutes over time, um, but I think Catherine or Jen has also put the link to the evaluation in the chat box. So question time. Have we got some more questions? There, there actually isn't any any more questions now. Great, there just, great. There was just one question about whether someone could receive the recording, but we've answered that. Yep, um, okay. So, great. yeah, if everyone could please fill in the evaluation, as Alana said, it's really important that we get feedback so we can continue to improve our um, education sessions. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. And um, a follow-up email will be sent with resources and the recording of the session. And if you're looking for any future events, um, just have a look on our website. Everything um, will be up, up there and you'll be able to um, register. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. And thanks, thank you, thanks Alana. That was a fantastic. I hope I met your learning needs. Thank you. A fantastic presentation, Alana. Yes, very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.